and gold for the big book rock. colonization, the legacies of exploitation and injustice haunt the world's disadvantaged nations. Although legally liberated, these nations are held as the economic hostages of their colonizers and the countries who have taken them hostage for far too long. Because Side Proposition believes that justice cannot be achieved by superficial action alone, we are very proud to propose today's motion, which is this House believes people living in the world's richest nations have a moral obligation to share their wealth with those living in the world's poorest nations. I'll be demonstrating two things in today's speech, the first of which is side proposition stance in today's round, as well as the burdens, and secondly, out to our first two substantive arguments, first on why Western nations have an obligation, or wealthier nations have an obligation to repent for historical injustice, and secondly, why it will increase quality of life. With that being said, I'd like to get into side proposition stance. First, we think of the proposition's burden in today's round is to demonstrate that lower income nations and citizens have a just claim to the wealth of individuals and wealthy nations. In the majority of cases, we think this is independent of practical considerations. We're going to be proving why on the principal level alone, they are entitled to these types of wealth. Point. Conversely, we think that the opposition must show that they do not have a claim to, these wealth, to this wealth, and that individuals in wealthier nations have no obligation to individuals in poor nations. We propose the following model for what this would look like. First, we think that it could be capital redist redistributed in a couple of different ways. First, through the form of physical property, second, through the form of money, and finally, through the form of resources. We think that the amount of contribution an individual in a wealthier nation would make would be proportional to that person's level of wealth. For example, people who are more socioeconomically disadvantaged would be, re would be required to contribute less than those who have more capital. Finally, we would say that this, this wealth that is shared with these poor nations would not be contingent in any way. It would be given to those nations as their own. With that being said, I'd like to get into our first substantive argument, which is that wealthier nations have a moral obligation to repent for historical injustice. First, we think it's very important to characterize what a moral obligation looks like. We think that actors have a moral obligation when they have inflicted harm on another entity. So, for example, if I take Raiden's computer, I have a moral obligation to give it back to him because I have wronged him and inflicted harm on him, in this case, economic harm. We think that specifically wealthier nations have an obligation to share wealth because they have inflicted harm on poor nations. Point. A couple of ways this has happened before I take a, before I move on, I'll take a we believe that the result of colonization was not that individuals in lower, um, less wealthier nations had their money taken away. Rather, we think it is more so about government instability, which is not recompensated with the money that proposition wants to provide. I mean, I would argue that both are equally consequences. Their resources were taken from them, and there was mass instability. Those are both consequences of colonization, but that furthermore, the two justifications I'm about to give you will demonstrate why that is not the case. First, because wealthier nations have acquired the capital that has made them wealthy by unjust means. A couple of different ways this has happened. First, by colonialism. We think that, for example, the reason why the economies of Senegal and Tunisia are struggling in the status quo is because France came in and exploited their resources, and exploited their people, and took away their wealth, and now France is in a better position than these other nations, and thus France has wronged these nations and has an ob obligation to share their wealth. We also think that it can take the form of things like slavery, where they are directly oppressing people and thus taking away those people's self-determination and ability to make capital and wealth for themselves. Finally, this can occur through other forms of hierarchy like patriarchy, which also has subjugated people of less wealthy nations to the power of wealthier nations. We think that the reason why they are wealthy is because of the suffering of the poor nations. The reason why the moral obligation takes the shape of wealth in today's debate is because that was the form of plunder that the wealthier nations used to subjugate the poor nations. We think that in this case, the moral obligation is guided by the principle of proportionality. In order to address the injustice, that is, it is inadequate for wealthier nations to offer superficial forms of, of reparations, like, for example, trade deals or things like that. We also think that they need to give them wealth to make sure that those nations have the ability to establish autonomy and function for themselves in a way that is not dependent on the whims of the wealthier nations. We think that because they have inflicted systematic harm on these less wealthy nations, those nations should have the right to have a capital for themselves in order to establish their own systems and operate as fully fledged countries. Point. We furthermore think, oh sure, yeah. We believe that it is the burden of the proposition to prove to you why it's not just about the impacts of colonization as to why these lower are these nations have less money, rather what it was specifically about colonization that led to this in the first place. 
I mean, I'm happy to go more into depth about the legacies of colonialism and colonization and why it impacted those nations, but I don't think we have a burden to prove that there's more than one cause. What we are saying is that colonization is the reason why these less wealthy nations have been subjugated to the wealthier nations. That's a fair burden. But furthermore, we would say that the wrongs of these wealthier nations are still present today in, the, in these other less wealthy nations because of things like trade deals that have disproportionately advantaged wealthier nations, economic institutions that only represent wealthier nations. Because that is on the part of the wealthier nations, these less advantaged nations should have an opportunity to determine themselves. But furthermore, the reason why we think that this is an obligation that exists on the individual level is because those that are living in wealthier nations have been advantaged by the capital that the wealthier nations accumulated. A couple of justi justifications for this. First, the idea that they receive benefits that come off of the wealth that was unjustly acquired. Things like peace, stability, and economic opportunities that they all have because their countries are in a more economically stable position that those in other nations do not. Secondly, because they've often been actively involved in electing leaders who have, per like, who have perpetrated colonialism. For example, during a United States period of democracy, the U.S. tried to colonize the Philippines. That was something that the American people consented to when they elected leaders. So oftentimes there is a certain degree of individual accountability that occurs that is accounted for by our plan. Sec but, but, but secondly, I'd like to introduce our second substantive argument on why this policy would increase quality of life. Two things under this argument. First, the idea of political checks. We think that when citizens have more capital under the system that we are proposing, they have more jurisdiction over their political circumstances in addition to their economic circumstances. One of the legacies of colonialism has been characterized by the unresponsive governments that have been in place and are not able to meet the needs of the people. Oftentimes, in the legacy of colonialism, stable governments were not able to be established that meet the needs of the people. However, when they have more capital, we think they are able to be more responsible. A couple of reasons for this. First, when individuals themselves have more wealth, it allows them to have more representation in government because they are focusing less on personal sustenance and more on more abstract gains and more abstract opportunities like pursuing um, governmental reform. But that secondly, once their obligation to their family is, is, is fulfilled and they are able to take care of their children, they are also more willing to focus on things like government. Furthermore, we think that governments are more prosperous and have programs that, uh, that come from tax money and more capital that's in the economies of these nations, and they are able to do things like institute social pro programs, institute judici judiciaries, and all things that help represent the people more and correct historical injustice. Our second layer of analysis revolves around the idea of infrastructure. Because, for example, we think that one of the major legacies of colonialism is that the infrastructure was broken. Two things under this. First, because colonialism was never designed to be a sustainable system. That is, when colonizers came into these countries, they did not design infrastructure to benefit the needs of the, of the individuals in that nation. Rather, it was driven by what would be the most lucrative for them. That means that there is no long-term system of infrastructure in place for the individuals still living in that nation. They oftentimes don't have access to things like potable water. They don't have access to things like shelter, but these are all things that change when there is more capital in the economy. But that secondly, oftentimes they don't have the resources to implement that infrastructure in the first place because it has been taken from them under a system of colonization. However, sometimes the wealth is going to take the form of property, it's going to take the form of money, all things that help them in implement a long-term sustainable system. Because we believe that superficial action is not enough, we invite you to throw a proposition in today's debate. Thanks a lot for your speech, and I call now the first speaker of the opposition. something abundantly clear. Side proposition in today's round already has and is going to continue to try to mischaracterize our position. They made the assumption that we're going to come up here and say, nah, colonialism never happened, and rich people don't have an obligation to hand back that unjustly acquired capital. Let's get that out of the way. Rather, we accept the fact that colonization happened. We accept the fact that many rich countries did these injustices to the poor countries, which is why they are poor. Today's debate is a question of the mechanism in which you solve that injustice and whether or not you adhere to your moral obligation. So on that, in my speech, I'm going to be doing three things. First, I'm going to, I'm going to 
add on to framing because we believe it was not enough coming out of side proposition. Second, I'll refute the substantive analysis brought to you by side propositions for speech. And finally, bring to our first two of three substantive arguments. Elise in the two will bring up our third. So first, on to framing. We believe the burden of side proposition is to show why countries are poor in the first place, and then why wealth, specifically material wealth, is the best form of recompense. Again, we don't dispute that colonization happened. We're talking about the mechanism here. We support, on our side of the house, a very specific model of global cooperation between rich and poor countries in order to sustain productive initiatives in terms of things like Point. infrastructure and institutions. This will look like things like <coughs> infrastructure, hospitals, schools, inclusion on social agreements. What we say is, additionally, Point. there's going to be cooperation with the local countries. You have to include the say from the governments of these poorer countries, and all of this will come without conditions. Unlike the IMF or the World Bank, it's not going to have the imperialist tendencies in terms of loaning agreements. We believe this model is good because it is the best, most productive way to help the world's poorest people. So on that, let's look at what they bring you. So first on a stance, they say our burden is to prove that they don't deserve any form of recompense. Again, we disagree with that. We say it's our burden to prove that they don't meet their own moral obligation. Now, basically for the entirety of their substantives, we don't disagree with any of the problems they bring you. Like, we agree that happened. I'll elaborate more in case on why we believe we better adhere to our moral obligation. I'll be sure to flag that once I get to that. But on this idea about political checks, they refute themselves. They say the reason that corruption occurs now is because they never had the political capital to ensure they could put that check on the, on the corruption. But the point in which corruption already exists, then there's no way to get the wealth to the people. They established a point in which corruption already exists, that wealth will never get there. So on that, let's get into our substantive analysis. Our first substantive argument is on the principle of proper restoration. Our first layer under this argument is on equivalent restoration. Let's actually characterize what the long-term effects of colonization looked like. Again, they actually proved part of this for us in the second layer of their second substantive argument. When countries were colonized, the colonizer had no incentive to develop proper institutions for long-term growth because they didn't see them as a country. They saw them as a sort of way to garner more profit for themselves, which means they didn't build things like schools or hospitals or good governmental norms to ensure that institutions could survive in the long run. And then secondly, during the revolution, they destroyed whatever means of infrastructure and means of institutions existed. And finally, after they achieved independence, they shunned them from the global world, making it even harder for them to establish those institutions. So this is where the clash in today's debate occurs. Yes, at the time of colonization, profits were decreased and wealth was stolen from these countries. But the reason they haven't been able to recuperate that wealth over time is because they didn't have the stability to do so. The lack of wealth is an impact of the lack of stability. In terms of restoration, we expect to receive equivalent compensation. So let's take their computer example. If I steal Raynan's computer, I'm not supposed to give him money to buy a new computer. He expects to get his same computer back. That is our principle. We say that if they stole stability, we want to give stability back. That's why we support initiatives, like we say, insofar as the long-term effects of colonization were removing stability. The impact of this is we agree, injustice has occurred, but the only way to fill the vast moral void left behind by Western colonialist, imperialist countries is to ensure that you have just and equivalent cooperation. Side proposition does not fulfill their moral burden of restorative justice. But the second layer is on the government obligations to its people. The primary role of the state is to protect its own constituents. So basic social contract theory here, right? You give up a certain amount of your rights, and in response, you expect a certain amount of protection back from the state. But even in the richest countries in the world, there are millions of people living in economic desperation. From LA to London, from Pittsburgh to Paris, there are people living on the streets unable to access a job, and economic stratification is growing at a higher rate than it ever has before. 
Meaning, a government has a principled obligation to first prioritize these individuals for two reasons. First, Often, they aren't the ones who benefited from the injustice of colonization in the first place, meaning the government is ignoring their own principal burden when they are just when they are oppressed. And secondly, paying for both is going to be mutually exclusive for two reasons. First, there's a finite amount of financial capital, and second, there's a finite amount of political capital. But I'll take a point. We think that the reason that your model is insufficient is because it specifically tries to use another colonialist mechanism of bringing in Western nations to fix the problems that they created in the first place. We have to allow countries themselves to develop instead of forcing Western powers upon them. We disagree. We say that when you just hand over wealth, nothing changes. And we think that it's going to have cooperation, like we say in our model. There's no going, not going to be any imperialist like tendencies and conditions like we see from the IMF and the World Bank. So our second sub is bolstering the restoration of poor communities. The first layer is snowballing benefits of stability initiatives. It's important to evaluate the comparative in today's debate. We believe our plan is better by achieving more long-term benefits for more people. Why do we think this? In their world, they're just giving money. There's four problems with this. First, it's a finite number of resources. When you distribute among a lot of people, then each of them get less. Second, it doesn't solve for the structural problems. Third, in the case of a corrupt government, which we recognize isn't the majority, that it's never going to get to the people. And fourth, it's limited to those who can access them. However, in our world, one, you keep reaping the benefits over time. Roads produce economic gains for decades, and that's vital because it produces more overall benefits. Second, it's more likely to solve structural stability problems. You need to build schools and hospitals to ensure these countries can prosper in the long term without the effects of uh, westernized wealth and western loans um, and what, what their model. Third is cooperation solves for the, co for the corrup corruption that they talk about because it ensures that like the West isn't just going to give up money if it's going to be to a corrupt government. We don't think we have to support that in today's debate. And fourth, we can improve. Um, you improve the use of roads and schools, and it's limited to those who access them. And that's why I'm proud to oppose the motion. Thanks a lot for your speech, and I call now the second proposition speaker to continue the work. that side opposition is so willing to be supportive of building relationships with other nations because, hey, these nations aren't imperialists anymore. I find it funny that they stand for the same paternalistic relations with smaller countries as the same colonizers do, and insofar as they don't show us any reasons why they will actually change, we think side opposition stands for fundamentally the same colonization as what has happened before. In this speech, first. I'm going to go, go down the opposition's case and show you why it's so flawed. Moving on, I'm going to go back to our case and show you why the feeble responses we heard from side opposition weren't enough before presenting our third argument about combating neocolonialism. But first, let's look at the opposition's case. A quick point on their counter model. We think that they don't actually ever show us why we can't also access this counter model. If it's really so great as they claim, why can't nations, in addition to having individuals pay recompense, why can't nations also help build these government infrastructures? We're going to contest the validity of these infrastructures later, but we think that if you if site opposition wins on this point, we can also claim it. But next. On their first substantive Point. argument, they give you an entire minute that proves the burden that they place on us. They tell us that the wealth from these corporate from these countries has been taken unjustly. They give us the same analysis as to why these countries are poor in the first place. We think this necessarily means that they're working in our favor to prove our burdens. But on their actual argument, the substan the substance of this argument was that a lack of wealth does not is not a, a good enough equivalent of compensation. The extent of this warrant was basically that if I break your computer, I have to give it back. We have a couple of problems with this. First of all, we would tell you that you can't actually give back a broken computer, right, in the same condition that it was. So whenever they say, hey, we're just going to return countries to the same level of instability as before, we don't think, or the same level of stability as before, we don't think that's something that you can actually do. Why? Because you've created irreparable damages upon these countries. Whenever you've killed 
like millions of people through the slave trade. Whenever you've stolen money upon money from these countries, we don't think that that's something that can be treated simply with just building relations. We think that's insufficient from side opposition. But moreover, their second layer of analysis talked about how people live in desperation within the status quo in richer countries, so governments shouldn't have the wealth, shouldn't have the responsibility to do this because they have to look after their own people. We would tell you to look to our model. We don't believe that poor people should have to be exploited in the same way these smaller countries have. We would tell you that this is a proportional response to the injustices that have been committed, and the people who create the most harm ought to be the ones that also pay the most. That's our model. But moreover, whenever they tell you that the government needs to prioritize, we would tell you that the governments aren't the ones giving back. It's the individuals that are giving back. And if they actually wanted to give back to the people, if the governments have that responsibility, they should not have colonized the smaller countries in the first place. We do not think it is their burden to show you that they have a bigger duty to their own people. We think that there's a principle in this debate that they've not engaged with. Their second substantive dealt entirely with money. The, the substance of this argument was that, first of all, that political capital is finite. Might as well not give it to these countries. We would tell you that something is better than nothing. And giving countries the ability to have money is better than giving them fake relations. Point. Moreover, whenever they tell you about how you can't have this money because it's not about structural reforms, governments won't be able to know what to do with it without these trade relationships. First of all, we would tell you if they're that great, we can claim them too. Second of all, we would tell you it's a little bit paternalistic to insinuate that countries who have experienced hundreds of years of colonization, want to do the best for their people, are incapable of doing so. That is egregious, and we reject that on side proposition. Moving on to our case, and the people responses that Luke gave you on to that. First of all, we think that the problem with this is that they completely ignored all of our first substantive argument, they basically said, hey, we agree with this because we agree also colonization was bad. The problem was that they weren't actually listening during our first proposition speech because we gave you three reasons why individuals in wealthier countries are uniquely culpable for these harms. We told you about the idea that these individuals receive benefits, they receive peace and stability and economic benefits from being able to live in countries that have profited off of hundreds of years of colonization. Moreover, we told you that people are actively involved in the perpetuation of this colonization so people can consent to voting whenever the U.S. decides to invade the Philippines. We get no engagement with this side proposition. We think it's so important because the principle of proportionality necessitates self-determination independent of the whims of the colonial powers. It also necessitates that unfair trade deals, like the opposition advocates for, have to be gone. We would also tell you that economic institutions are especially harmful. None of this gets engaged with. Our second substantive argument deals with the quality of life only response here is that corruption will still exist, and so they can't actually get their wealth to the people. First of all, we would say that this is independent of the principled argument here. This is about a moral obligation. So if countries ought to have this moral obligation, we think it has to go to the people, regardless of what the government will do with it. But second of all, we don't think that this is necessarily true. And so far the, as they don't show us why these corporations, why these countries are actually corrupt, we painted them as unstable. That does not mean the same thing as corrupt. We think that many countries, like that of Nigeria and like that of um, Vietnam, are like growing very rapidly, if they have more political capital, then they would be able to develop more quickly and provide more social programs for their people. We reject the narrative that like, is basically very paternalistic that says that countries do not have the capability to take care of their own people because they're inherently corrupt. Moving on, we told you about how political checks will actually solve for a lot of their problems, right? So whenever you're able to have better judiciaries, better social programs, and better government participation because of giving back political capital, that is a reason you have to. We also told you about how infrastructure is able to help these things. We get no response, but here's why this is so important. Infrastructure is a prerequisite to stability in these countries, because without the ability to have things like good education, or have things like the ability to have uh, good roads to get to places where you can access point. different things, you cannot actually have peace within a region. Before I move on to the third substantive argument, I'll take a point. Nobody on the proposition has yet engaged with the fact that even though you concede that structural problems with education and government is the problem, that it is not fixed by simply giving a lower wealthy company a country money. It is rather fixed by long-term deals as to how they can actually improve in the long term. Three things. You don't talk to us about these long-term deals. How do we know that they're going to fix anything? Second of all, paternalistic to assume that these countries aren't going to be able to maintain the resources themselves. And third of all, we would think on a principal level, give the money to the countries. You stole it from them. That is the thing that they have not engaged with. Third substantive is on combating neocolonialism. First layer of analysis, only layer of analysis on corporations. 
Corporations exist, and many of the largest corporations choose to exploit poor countries on the basis that they are weak and vulnerable. We see this in Bangladesh, where Walmart factories force workers to work in inhumane conditions, forcing them to be exposed to toxic chemicals without safety regulations. The minimum wage in Bangladesh is $65 a month, which is far below that of the living living wage in that country. This is an extension of colonialism because they use the same methods as the colonizers to oppress them. They use they force these countries to become dependent on them and then reap the benefits from that. We see that two groups have a moral requirement to act. First, the rich owners or executives in rich countries that look to lower labor laws. This plunder necessitates compensation for two reasons. First of all, we think there's a certain amount of time theft that occurs when underpaid workers are paid subhuman wages and not given actual recompense. We think that even if this money goes to the country instead of the people, it's necessary beneficial because they're able to benefit from the social programs that come about from that country because they aren't getting paid enough so they have to rely on them. Second of all, we would tell you that they make money on the broken hopes and the broken backs of individuals on a basis of deceit. Oftentimes they are promised to get pay and they do not receive it. The second group that has a moral requirement to act is the everyday individuals. That's the heart of this motion. We think that the reason why they have this obligation is because they benefit from corporate exploitation in three ways. First of all, we think that they are oftentimes directly as paid as workers. For example, Walmart is the largest employer within the world. Second of all, they benefit from the economic stimulation that these companies provide within their home countries. And third of all, the money that goes to taxes in the government creates stronger government so they have more stability economic opportunity, and structural programs. At the end of this day, this debate is very clear. Do you accept a paternalist narrative that rejects countries' ability to self-determine, or do you accept a narrative that accounts for the history of colonization and gives those people recompense? Thank you. Thanks a lot for the speech, and I call now the second speaker of the, from the office. other side get away with the characterization of this round, in which the proposition has to be the side that says, yes, we made a mistake and now we're trying to correct for it, while the opposition has to defend the impossible side of making absolutely no corrections, saying we weren't in the wrong. Luke told you at the beginning of his first speech that this debate should be about the mechanism as to which the corrections actually happen. What we needed to see from the proposition was engagement as to what that pro that uh, engagement is going to look like, what that action looks like, and who that action benefits. Three things in this speech. First, I'll be looking at our model, seeing at, at what the response was from the other side of the house and why it still stands. Then I'll be going on to the two main ideas we've seen so far in this debate. First, the structural meaning of what we're trying to propose and oppose, and second, what economic funding actually looks like on both sides of the house. Then I'll be set, setting up our third substantive argument for side opposition about the dehumanization of the people in poor countries under the propositions of the house that would therefore exist. So the argument that we got coming from the proposition about what our stance in today's debate is, is just, we can do this too. Unfortunately for the proposition, Luke gave specific analysis explaining why this actually is just going to fall on our side of the house. First of all, he told you that there are problems with just throwing capital at a country. We think that that's going to hurt the nation, but I'll get more into this under our dehumanization point. But second, a big idea that Luke hit on was that uh, capital is finite, meaning that you can't both throw capital at a nation in hopes to solve the problem, but then put a large amount of capital into trying to fund infrastructure projects. Moreover, we talked about the specific benefits of those infrastructure projects, explaining that it's not just the West imposing their ideology on these poor countries. Instead, it's Western nations or the richer nations and these poor nations working together. We think that's fundamental for our side of the house. But first of all, the first idea we've seen so far in this debate is looking at the structural means. Again, they're trying to characterize us as just a flat out immoral actor. What we need is engagement on what we have been practically trying to do. While this is a moral obligation motion, we think that the moral obligation should be helping the certain group of people. So if you have a moral obligation, but just in the nebulous, and you don't actually achieve helping 
the people that you set out to help, then what is that point of the moral obligation if your means weren't going to work in the first place? We think it should be at least to some level effective. So again, we needed the engagement with why Luke told you that the capital was actually going to be a bad idea. First, finite resources. Second, structural issues that it doesn't solve for. We didn't get any engagement. We don't think that just by giving a country money that we're going to see that kind of benefit. But that kind of bleeds over into what economic funding on both sides of the house looks like. Again, this was wildly mischaracterized by the proposition. What we did say is that when you give capital to a country, it's not necessarily going to help all the people in the way that it was going to help, that we hoped it was going to help them. Are some countries in poor nations corrupt? Yes. Are all countries corrupt that are poor? No, that is not the side of the house that we were trying to explain. But we said when that corruption does exist, we think it's problematic to the point where if you are just throwing capital in a situation, you're not actually providing any progress. You're not actually solving any kind of issue. That's why our plan, that's why our stance to just go for infrastructure development is so much better. Again, we gave you a lot of analysis as to why this is the case. When you have this infrastructure development, then you were able to build that infrastructure that benefits everyone. Luke explained that, for instance, when you build a road, you are going to have that mass benefit. Before I move on, I'll take a point. Why can't governments decide what their country needs the most and then use the political capital that they get from the individuals of all your countries and decide to build infrastructure projects? Okay, so what I told you and Luke told you was that when these richer nations and poor nations work together, that it provides two main benefits. First of all, it provides that direct benefit to infrastructure, but second, when they are working together, it provides more a cooperation between the two countries. We think that that's going to provide benefits in the long run as far as economic growth for those uh, poor countries because then there is not only that center for the infrastructure development, but also future things like trade. It's important that we're not hinging our entire stance off trade, but we think that it would be good in the future for trade to exist. Trade helps GDP. But in the, again, there was a lack of, uh, con, uh, there was a lack of uh, the opposition seeing that there was going to be the proposition answering our principled argument. What did we think that looked like? While they said that there should be a restorative response, we don't think the proposition actually gave you that restorative response. Luke brought up the analogy of the computer, but then when the proposition reiterated that analogy, all of a sudden the computer's broken. The problem is we need a consistent analogy. We think that what a richer country took away in the first place, that should be what they are point, giving point. back. We think the only way to get there is stability. The problem with the proposition is they didn't adequately prove that stability would actually happen on their side of the house, we've spent a significant amount of time pointing out the problems, again, with just uh, throwing capital at the situation. But now moving on to our third substantive argument about the dehumanization of people in the poor countries. Our first layer of analysis is looking at how the world's perception would be of this issue. Let's look at what happens when you just send money to a foreign country with the idea in mind of helping a peop the people group of that country. Here are the characteristics of that situation. First, the people of the wealthier na nations send money to a foreign country, most often with the intentions, but the intervention stops there. They never meet the people receiving the money and or the government of that nation. Instead, they think of them as that faceless figure in the distant world. Second, the wealthy person making this kind of contribution feels a sense of moral satisfaction as having completed a charitable deed. The problem with that is all of a sudden these Western and wealthier nations believe they have fixed a problem that they haven't necessarily solved. Again, as far as just putting money in a situation doesn't actually provide that kind of structural stability that infrastructure would cause, then retro nations just get to say, well, we solved that problem, sorry about colonialism, we fixed that. Instead, when there's actual cooperation between wealthier nations and poor nations, that's when we see progress right. happening, that's why it's specific to our side of the house. So when that money is being sent, this means there is a sharing of wealth, which equates to writing up as a tax deduction. It helps, it checks the box of the good work for that wealthier nation. We think that that's inherently problematic because first, when the individuals perceive those of poor nations as a self-gratifying charity project, it de dehumanizes the people of those nations. This only furthers the social perception that those poor nations are inherently less of value than the richer nations. 
patients, we think that that's really problematic. That doesn't happen with the same level of cooperation. Furthermore, this changes in our world with sustainable investment because we told you that that model means that we characterize communication with those nations. We think that intergovernmental cooperation is very important. We only see that on our side of the house. This has become a really comparative debate. The world that we need to be looking at, the aspect of the opposition side of the house, is the way in which we are implementing our policy, the way in which we are benefiting a certain group of people. Yes, we have a moral obligation, but we believe the only way we achieve that moral obligation is actually helping the people that were oppressed in the first place. The way to do that is voting for the opposition. Thanks a lot for your speech, and I call now the speaker of the proposition. The method that a side opposition gives you in today's debate is a lot like the colonialism that we are all rejecting on both sides of the house. You invite in Western nations, they determine how you build up infrastructure and education, and they're the ones who become these quote-unquote saviors that can help these countries that are too corrupt, too stupid, and too broken to fix their own problems. Side opposition fundamentally rejects this narrative. We think that these countries are capable of building up their own countries and economies, and we are proud to oppose today's motion. In my speech, I'm going to do two things. First, go through three strategic flaws on our opponent's side, before a second, moving into our three questions. First, which side best promotes proportionality? Second, which side best promotes stability? And third, which side best improves quality of life for people within these nations? First, on their strategic flaws. Number one, they go don't give you anything mutually exclusive in their model. This means that everything that happens on their side can also be brought on the proposition case. At their highest ground where you believe everything in their model is good, we can also have that. There is no reason why accountability and checks cannot coexist along with the distribution of wealth. Secondly, you have failed to adapt to our speech because they've asked time and time again to talk about wealth and this mechanism when our first speech and second speech were fully about that 16 minutes of constructive material on why wealth is, ne is necessary. Further my speech, I'm going to continue on that. But third, they also focus far too much on practical outcomes. Even at the point where they win on these, which we don't think they do, but even if they were to do so, we think that this debate is about moral obligation. That is the objective and operative word that we need to focus on, and focusing on the practical far too much on their side is a massive strategic flaw. First question, which side best promotes proportionality? We both agree that this is crucial to fulfill the moral obligation of a nation. Opposition's model is that the wealth right now is insufficient because of corruption within these nations. First of all, we fundamentally disagree. We think this is a paternalistic attitude, and oftentimes saying that this justifies not giving them enough funding is insufficient to prove why you fulfill a moral obligation. Secondly, like they concede to you, it is a minority of cases, and they don't give you a significant net harm. Number three, governments are better with capital because they are able to organize things like the funding of infrastructure. Even if they are corrupt, they are still obligated to their citizens through the social contract. And many of these governments still fund things like infrastructure projects and education. That is still within the role of that government. But fourth and finally, at their highest ground, Understand that even if these countries are all broken and corrupt, it is the cause, it is the result of decades upon decades of colonialism and imperialism. When Western nations like Britain and France come into your country, destroy your infrastructure, blow up your roads, and don't care about long-term sustainability for the economy and for the people, that is the reason why there was this problem in the first place. Asking those same countries to come back and fix it is no solution to that. Proposition says that wealth is going to be better. Why is this true? There are three key reasons. First, you grant governments flexibility, which means that you're able to fund initiatives that the people themselves need. Secondly, it is not what was taken. Wealth, resources, and property were taken from these individuals in the first place. It is not proportional and or just to give them back that information, uh, to give them back um, something that is different fundamentally. For example, if you steal someone's computer, you can't give them back money. Third, Governments are the ones that are best qualified to understand, uh, to understand how to best invest this money. Why is this true? There are two reasons. First, they better understand the geography and the constructive needs of that country. They better understand the needs of the people. And secondly, they represent the people. They have direct representation, which Western nations can never provide you. The only response here is that you diminish political capital and you disincentivize change in the long term. But the reason we think that this is untrue is because this is a, number one, a practical problem which doesn't absolve moral responsibility. But second, we can also support long-term sustainable funding. Nothing in this motion says that we only have to support a lump sum 
one-time payment. We absolutely support long-term rehabilitation for the, uh, or long-term, sorry, um, retribution and reparation for these countries that justly deserve it. Second question, which side best promotes stability? This is important on principle because the moral obligation of this motion is also, in also includes parts where you have to improve the quality of life for these individuals within nations. The opposition says that they support initiatives to build infrastructure in low-income countries with Western nations. Why is this not good? Number one, it is incredibly paternalistic and you assume that these countries can't operate on them by themselves. Secondly, it has neo-colonialist tendencies. Western nations being added will only bring problems even if they don't have the intention to exploit those nations because they will always have the incentives of wanting influence, of wanting culture, of wanting money. Those countries will never want fair terms when they make these deals and when they make these voluntary negotiations. Third, you don't fulfill your moral obligation because we have to empower individual nations. Why is this true? Like we told you, colonialism was paternalistic fundamentally, but it derived the right to things like self-determination and the ability to make decisions by these countries in the first place. Continuing to deprive that from these nations, continuing to distrust their governments and decrease the legitimacy of those nations, fundamentally continues the neo-colonialist legacy that side proposition fundamentally regrets and rejects. But fourth, at their highest ground, we can also utilize international accountability without direct involvement by Western nations. Understand that global checks right now exist in every sense of the word because of the fact that we already have um, like aid and humanitarian funds that include international monitoring but without international Western intervention. Side proposition says that we can have create structural fixes in the long term. But why is this really true? First of all, we support increasing funding to infrastructure. Like our model told you, we think that investing in this wealth into those nations isn't solely giving them money. You forget the nuances of what wealth includes. It includes property, it includes resources, it includes the necessary um, like money in some instances to fix these systematic problems. Secondly, people become more prosperous and are able to engage in the government. This is really important because you cause checks to increase in the long term. When people are far more prosperous, they're more able to focus on things like governmental reform instead of on things like short-term sustenance. Look towards countries like India, for example, which as time has increased, has now begun focusing on anti-corruption campaigns and improving the efficacy of the government. Third, we think that in the long term, our side does structural reform better because the individuals within a country have a just representation within that government. When those governments go and make these fixes and make these decisions, they are accessing the, self, uh, the accountability and the self-determination that has been robbed from these individuals historically. Before I move on to my third question, is there a point of information? Seeing none, moving on to our third question, which side best promotes and increases the quality of life overall? Side opposition says that governments have this obligation to low-income people, which, number one, is true, but it's not mutually exclusive. We think that governments can both feed their low-income people along with providing reparations and providing wealth for other countries. Secondly, our model specifically excludes having to include low-income people to pay into the system because we think that you have to fulfill your own ability to survive before you can actually engage in our reparations. Third, even in cases where there is a trade-off and you can only do one of the two, these countries and these individuals are more obligated to low-income nations. Why is this true? Number one, those are the countries that have had wealth taken from them unjustly. These low-income individuals within society have, um, have like faced challenges because of institutional barriers, but the governments themselves have created this, and those individuals were born into those, uh, like, those individuals have suffered because of those governments' decisions. But more importantly, and secondly, the plunder and, ens and enslavement of the ancestors within these low-income countries has created systemic and historical harms that go on to this day. Until those problems are acknowledged, there is never true moral obligation being fulfilled. Proposition improves the quality of life for people, especially the victims of neocolonialism, for two reasons. First, people who currently benefit off of exploitation in rich nations. For example, people in America who buy computers that are made by children in Bangladesh now have to have redistribution of wealth to improve those conditions and redistribute that kind of capital, like we told you in our third substantive argument. But secondly, you fulfill that moral obligation in the most holistic way, because giving that wealth gives them not only the money and the resources necessary, but also the self-determination that their side doesn't give you. We don't want to involve Western nations. We don't believe in furthering this neo-colonialist legacy. We are proud to propose today's motion. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your speech, and I call now the third speaker of the opposition.
what the world we are living in actually looks like. It looks like right now the divide between those who are poor and those who are rich continues to grow further and further apart. And while globalization is on the rise, we become so separated on something such as money. This debate does not boil down to whether or not there is an obligation. We both agree as the proposition in opposition that there is an obligation. Rather, it is how we don't further entrench these poor countries into poverty and to instability. It's about how we actually help them out. And for that reason, I am so proud to oppose. In this speech, I'll first go over an important characterization that needs to be made, then asking the two most important questions in today's debate, who wins on the principle and then who wins on the practical, to show you why an opposition ballot is much more preferable at the end of this round. But first, I'd like to bring up a strategic error that was made thus far by the, op by the proposition. Their strategic error is that they continue to mischaracterize the opposition as a way to go around a lot of the sustainable offense that we brought to you throughout their case or throughout our case. First, they paint us as this ignorant actor that really doesn't acknowledge that there's a problem right now with less wealthier countries in the status quo. I think by this point in this debate, we can all recognize that both sides agree that there's a problem, but they lack engagement in showing why our model specifically was so bad and does not solve these problems in the long term. This is incredibly problematic as, for, moreover, they changed their stance throughout the entirety of their speech. Remember in their first speaker, they talked about how wealth was only going to be focused on capital, and that was actually what most of their case was actually contingent on, people actually getting money. But then as soon as they heard our counter model in which we basically propose long-term engagement, they said in most recently their third speaker that they support things like buildings. That actually is what we are proposing in the first place. The line seems to be coming more blurred and blurred as to what the proposition world looks like. Therefore, we so much prefer an opposition ballot. Therefore, I'm going to be moving into the two most important questions that need to be asked in today's round. First, who wins on the principal level? And second, who wins on the practical level? But first, let's see why the opposition wins on the principal level. We think that the proposition brought up this idea in which colonization is basically really bad and resulted in systematic poverty. What we tell you on the opposition is that we agree 100%. But first, they never proved to you as to why this losing of, losing of money and poverty was a direct result of the inherent nature of what colonization was in the past. We explained that even though it was true that as a result the impact was that nations became poor over time, we believe that the point of colonization and what it actually, and the institutions that it attacked in the first place, were actually the governments to make them more stable. We need to recognize in this debate that yes, there is a lot of merit in saying that these nations are poor because of colonization, but recognize they're missing a big step, the fact that you're only poor because colonization caused government instability. And we believe that there's also more impacts just to prove it right, as to why colonization wasn't only about losing money. For example, as a result of colonization, there are other impacts like social division, division with the nations that have been affected. Losing money is only one of these characteristics characterization, and there's many more that result in a direct result of colonization that are at the same exact level of the wealth that they continue to talk about. And second, we believe that at the point that we both agree that there's a problem, we fulfill the principle by giving back the stability into the government. Before I explain this, I'll take a point. We think even at your highest ground, your model of having governments give money back to those people is indirect wealth redistribution from individuals. That is a proposition side of the ballot, and that means that's a reason for you to propose. We have made the comparative quite clear down the entire bench. There's a difference between me giving an individual $10 and then me signing a contract with an individual for a long-term growth plan in which we're both going to be working on a project that has mutual benefits to both parties. There's a difference between giving someone money and actually setting up prosperity, which is what we propose on that model, but more on that on the practical level. We think that this debate wasn't about the principle, when, or just to explain as to why we went on the principle, if I steal someone's car, for example, it doesn't make sense for me to just give that individual money. Rather, I should give them back what I stole from them in the first place. In the case of colonization, it was exactly the government's ability which was stolen. We think that this debate wasn't about the principle when both sides agreed that there was an obligation, but we believe that we still fulfill the principle by providing solutions to the original problem, not just an impact off of it. But the second question is who wins on the practical level? The proposition gives you this idea at the top of their speech that they quite did poorly at carrying down their bench. They give this idea that money allows people to access a higher quality of life because money 
prevents people from focusing on other things like feeding themselves at night. But what we tell you on opposition, that this is first contingent on them getting this aid in the first place, which as we explained may not happen with corrupt governments, but they seem to have this problem, but we clarify our stance on this. We don't think that all governments are corrupt. We think that a small minority actually prevents them from accessing their impacts. But why does our model solve and counteract against any corrupt governments that exist in the status quo? Because it creates a direct interaction in the first place. We think that in a world where developed nations actually have to meet with the governance of these less wealthier nations, they have to make a plan in our model to make sure that they're actually sustainable, to make sure that they're actually working together. We support things like long-term agreements, remember, to set up a sustainable country. This looks like things like schools, roads, and so forth. But to be able to extend this, let me prove to you as to why this explicitly is going to improve the state of the government and make them less corrupt. What makes them improve the government as a whole is because when they are when they are going to cooperate with these nations, we think that is incredibly beneficial thus far as creating a long-term strategic plan to make sure that these developed nations want to make the most out of these long-term plans that they are creating under our side of the house. Simply put, on our side of the house, there is no incentive for a developed nation to just give someone a strategic plan and then not follow through. We think that these developed countries are more likely to follow through with the characteristics that we set up rather than just sending over a few million dollars and hoping that they make the most out of it. But to extend this, uh, but then the proposition says that all this is is just basically us extending colo colon colon colonization ideas. But before that, I'll move into a point. If wealthy nations have control and jurisdiction over the money being sent to lower income nations, how can you ensure that there is going to be fair terms when they have adverse and different incentives? There is a difference because on your side of the house, all you're pretty much proposing is that we're sending over money to developing nations. Rather, on our side of the house, we make sure that there is a strategic plan as to how long-term partnerships can be made. There is a clear, dis clear distinction on our side of the house. But I'd like to say something very clear that needs to be said thus far in today's debate. I think both sides of that agree that on either side there's going to be some sort of influence by more developed nations. But we're going to think, and that we argue, that we're going to prevent further colonization and further direct influence in the long term. Why is that the case? Because we believe that what is so unique to the proposition world is that giving money is basically setting up countries to fail at the point where these developed nations just become more so dependent on the money that they are receiving. Rather, in the world of the opposition, we make sure that these countries, sure, at some point they may to be dependent on the West, but there is progress in the long term in making sure that they don't have to rely on the West when they're woefully poor. We think this is incredibly beneficial at the point where money only goes to set up a developing country to fail and just rely on another country in the first place. This impacts us a lot of the things that went unresponded to that Elise brought up to you. The narrative that that people who are in lower developed nations are having an obligation to developed nations. We think that this was an incredible impact that simply went uncontested to by the proposition. Because we both agree that there is a problem, but we both differ on how there is a solution. We believe that that of the opposition is one that is much more preferable. So proud to oppose. I told the first words out of my mouth in today's round that side proposition was going to try and characterize us as paternalistic and abusive to the rest of these colonized countries. Surprise, surprise, that's exactly what happened. Let's be very clear on what our model was and why we don't believe it's paternalistic. First, there were no conditions applied, laugh all you want. First, there were no conditions applied like historical loans coming from the IMF and the World Bank. And secondly, the cooperation was just in place there as a form in the 1% of chances in which there is cooperation, in which there is corruption, to avoid it. We've said over and over again that in the vast majority of cases, they're going to do exactly what the poorer country wants and needs. It's only in the case in which corruption would inhibit any practical outcomes of happening. In my speech, two simple things. I'm going to ask who best meets their moral obligation and how do you best promote economic growth in these countries. So first, who best meets their moral obligations? Like we've said before, both sides agree on the principle here. Insofar as an, injust in an injustice has occurred, the oppressor must respond with equal restorative justice. They say wealth was taken, so you must give wealth back. We contend that no, 
Rather, what they took in the long term was the stability from these countries, so wealth isn't a proper form of recompense. We gave you three very specific reasons why, none of which were engaged with. First, before revolution and before independence, there was no incentive for the colonizer to build up things like schools, hospitals, norms, institutions, so they were left bereft of that. Secondly, during revolution, they destroyed whatever did exist. And then third, afterwards, they ensured they shunned them from the international community so they couldn't build that up in the future. So why isn't wealth enough? Because it doesn't restore the problems of stability. Lost wealth? is a function of a lack of stability. But even if you buy their argument that at the time of colonization they took wealth away through things like taxes and resource extraction, look to all the years after. Why are countries still poor? Why have they not been able to recuperate this wealth over time through economic growth? We contend that is because they didn't have stability. Without stability and international norms, they weren't able to build up the economy necessary to recuperate their wealth. That's why the only way to fill the moral obligation is with stable institutions specifically. But now, how do you best promote economic growth? Let's clarify why our model is mutually exclusive. First, there's a finite amount of economic capital in the world, and second, there's a finite amount of political capital in the world. I'd love to live in their fantasy land where we can spend however much we want, where we can afford to give lump sums of money and afford to build bridges and roads, but let's be a little more practical. That's not realistically what's going to happen. Either you give lump sums or you give these specific initiative projects. And now on this idea about corruption, it was not our characterization that countries are corrupt. Literally in their first substantive argument, they said corruption occurred because of colonization. So we responded to that and we said, okay, you just proved corruption has occurred. How, we asked them to engage with how does sending lump sums of money to corrupt countries ever engage with that? That's why our model protects from those 1% of cases in which that corruption occurs. But the point at which our models are the same in terms of where the money goes on all practical outcomes, we, there's only one thing left on the flow. What does our side have? This idea about dehumanization. On their side of the house, you just give the money over to a faceless person, the idea of charity. But rather on our side of the house, you force them to engage with the real life tangible consequences of what their historical injustices have done. So at the point in which both sides want to ensure nothing like colonization ever happens again. How do you best do that? You force them to come to terms with the decades and centuries of injustice that they've done before. It's because face-to-face -face cooperation creates that sense of, oh no, we messed up. That's why I'm proud to propose the motion. Thanks for the speech, and I call another proposition to speak, uh, request speaker to conclude the debate. opposition gets many things extremely backward in today's debate. Most notably, coming out of the op lock, we saw this mischaracterization of wealth where they told us that the reason why poor countries are poor today was because colonization left a lack of instability, which meant that now they couldn't gain wealth in the future. We think that this is ahistoric considering we gave you substantive analysis dead down the bench that proved to you why colonization meant that these countries came in and took capital in the form of resources, in the form of people, in the form of actual money. We think that this is what created political instability, and if you buy their analysis, we just think that political instability further furthered and perpetuated it, not that it was the cause. In this speech, we're going to be asking two questions. Who best fits under Prop's definition of moral obligation, and who best fits under Ops definition, because they seem to be a little bit competing in this debate. But first, our definition tells you that the individuals ought to have the right, or ought to have the necessity to give back. What did we have in this debate? We basically told you that we gave you a lot of analysis as to why individuals uniquely have this obligation. Recognize that they don't actually say at any point in this debate that individuals shouldn't have this obligation. They just say that you should prefer our model. If you looked at the analysis we give you about individuals versus that that they give you, it's very insufficient. But down the bench, we've told you individuals have this obligation because of the principle of stolen property. If you steal something, give it back. 
That is the thesis of our case. We think that this property has been acquired unjustly, and we think that if it's in many cases in the form of money, you can give that back in the form of money. But moreover, on the second idea of proportionality, this answers their argument about the moral obligation being about self-defense, or being about, sorry, increasing stability, right? Because we think that the idea of self-determination, of unfair trade deals, of unfair economic institutions, all of these things mean that these countries have to be the actors or the ones that are going to be creating their own infrastructure within these countries. We think that a history of exploitation cannot be solved by more intervention by Western powers. We think about that by Wait, we think by proposing solution to fixing a problem of Western intervention, you propose more Western intervention. We think that's a little bit backwards. But moreover, let's look at who best fits under the opposition's definition of moral obligation. This is where we take them at their very highest ground. And if you buy everything that side opposition has told you, we still win this debate. Because they define moral obligation as whoever can best return colonized states to the original. We told you that you can't do this in either side of the house because the actors don't have the incentive to do so. So whenever they say that Western nations will magically be able to all of a sudden be like, hey, we're going to return you to your original state. You can't do that. Why? Because people have been taken. Resources have been too. You can't just give that stuff back. It has to be proportional with the, uh, with the principle that we tell you. Moreover, we told you that in the best case scenario, we see Western nations always want to influence these nations. Whether or not they have the, uh, whether or not they have the ambition to do so, they always shape that culture. We think that's pernicious because of the incentives. They claim that their plan is a strategic plan in the last speech. They spent 28 minutes saying that the country is in power is going to do whatever they can to help those poorer country, but they don't actually tell you why they're going to do this. They don't provide you, provide you incentive analysis as to why there can't be actual checks on this. They just say that it's going to happen in the minority of instances. We think that insofar as history shows you that there is going to be exploitation, this will continue. But lastly and finally, we would tell you that these Western nations, are that these smaller countries can do it by themselves, and they have to be the actor. This is why you're voting side proposition, because of the idea that they can create their own own political checks, their own infrastructure. Liana, myself, and Raiden all give you extensive analysis as to why this happens on our side of the house as well as on their side of the house. But even if you buy every single line of propositions analysis, we still think that you support our side because of the POI reigning gives during the third opposition. This is, is this to say that governments using money is just indirect redistribution of individuals' wealth. This necessarily means that if you pay taxes as an individual to the government, and then the government uses that money to help other people, we think that that is a redistribution of an individual wealth. We think that insofar as they try to gain offense by crossing the side of the house, we think that's unfair. This debate is about the principle. It's about colonization. It's about the history these countries have had to endure, and that's why you're going to be voting proposition. Thanks a lot, a lot for the debate, and we will announce the results in the big room, because we need to move